Stoli Vodka is one of the world's most awarded premium vodkas. With a commitment to uncompromising quality since 1938, Stoli controls every aspect of its vodka making, from planting, harvesting the finest ingredients, to distilling and bottling. This process has been followed for decades to guarantee the consistency and quality and signature ultra-smooth taste in each iconic bottle produced. Isn't it time you picked up Stoli Vodka for a try? For those who know their vodka well, and themselves even better, Stoli, the vodka. Check out Stoli as the official vodka in Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. Enjoy responsibly. 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Stoli Group USA LLC, New York, New York. Attention shoppers, clean up on aisle 14. Clean up on aisle 14. Someone dropped a jar of pickles. 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 Beatboxing at a big box store. Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to Geico. A red mini vamp has the lights on in the parking lot. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Geico. Skolik and Wingo on ESPN Radio and ESPN2. Presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests on the Shell Pennzoil performance line. Today, it's a little different. I mean, it, it's... You're not Wingo. Well, Who are you? I'm, you know, I'm the much... No, no, I'm not even... I was going to go with better looking. You're woman. almost uh, as old. Wow. That's to... That's... this. We're, we're not even a minute. So if you're over under was old jokes from Golik Jr. Yeah. Uh, on a minute and a half. This is this is fair. Uh, the, the man that has... Uh, what what am I a sneaky vampire? Sneaky you, yeah. vampire, yes. Yeah. J- Jason Fitz, former p- fiddle player and sneaky vampire. Yeah, that, that's it. That, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, Trey gets to go on a little a little jaunt, gets right. to go on a little vacation. So I think we should rename the the show Fitz in the in the Two Towers of Golic. I think that's uh, Fitz and the Two Towers of Golic. Yeah, you guys, did, did you put some thought into that? Yeah, well, maybe a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> is that, that, is that know, because Fitz and the Tantrums is already a band? But it, it is, and I don't get any royalties. Yeah, from he that, put his name know? first on that. I did. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. well. Listen, you see. He named it like a band. Like, it's yeah, not just bleeding. Fitz and the Golics the yeah, way that a yeah. sports talk radio person would name it. No. It's Fitz and the Towers. There's got to be some other descriptive word in there that only someone with the band experience that Jason has would toss in. Is this what the rest of the week is going to oh, be yeah. like? Oh, you're, yeah. You're in for a lot of it. Now, you you flopped from from the 6 o'clock to, uh, at night to 6 o'clock in the morning. You've done the no. 12-hour flip, right, no. from... From Spain and Fitz, you do in the evening to now six in the morning with uh, with Mike and I. So we appreciate you making that making that turn for us. Well, you know it's worth it. You two, you two are are absolutely worth the lack of sleep. Whatever, um, you're lying there. <laughs> yeah, uh, and because we're going to get into how we did the Twitter live thing at our house for the Super Bowl, the first half and halftime, and how Jason Fitz absolutely ruined the Justin Timberlake halftime show for us. You're welcome, absolutely America. ruined it for us. You know, as as uh, Mike said, the uh, fiddler with the band Perry. So you you know that business, and you you peeled back the onion, uh, the layers of the onion, a little bit there. I did, by the way, just hear Mike say that if I don't bust out a fiddle, he's yeah. going to take the rest of the week off. Do you guys think that I just carry one around, like I just store it under my armpit? Yes. Or? Yeah, yeah, more or less. Yeah, okay. we just kind of figure how that's that's kind of what life is for you at this point. Now that you're not doing it professionally, you need some sort of outlet, so it's always just there for you to fiddle on. <laughs> If so, you ever find yourself on a roof, per no, se. If I creepily just start pulling a fiddle out for yeah, the rest yeah. of the, we're, we're good with that. That's what it, it, it will the, be completely expected. And, and you'll, you'll play, right? Forrest, you'll do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Because sure. I, I just what I asked you, uh, when you were over for the Super Bowl, I said, is a fiddle, a, a fiddle player have to know the devil went down to Georgia like a guitar player has to know stairway to heaven? Yes. Is, is that kind of, yes. you, you have to know that. Yeah. And I'm not very good with, with lyrics to anything. So I don't really know, like whenever you sit in with the band, they're like, Ooh, let's do devil went down to Georgia. Then they look at me and they're like, all right, sing it. I, I'm not the best with the whole lyric thing. I so. know the words. Well, good. Okay. You play it. I'll sing it. No, we're, this is, this is going to be a viral sensation. See, and my question with all this is, is because this has got to be the expectation every time you've hopped on a mic since yeah. you started into yeah. sports talk radio. And this is actually weird and I kind of an identity question that you know, because you were an NFL player for right. nine years before you got into this, but 18 years later now, We've had instances where, uh, you know, people that have shadowed on this show didn't yeah. even know that you played football. Didn't know they I just played. Know you in this va- knew you in this vein. So I wonder how long it's going to take for you, Fitzy, before the expectation every time you come in the studio is where's the fiddle? Uh, about well, I mean, I think the music community took about three minutes to forget about me, but ESPN <laughs> will take far, far longer. By uh, the way, that guy that uh, didn't know I played football, he lasted one day here. <laughs> He's gone. 
That's fair. Yeah, we don't talk about him no more. <laughs> now that now that we've given you all the fiddle takes you could ever want for the beginning of a show, let's uh, let's get to some actual sports. It's time for off the top. It's time for off the top. Whether you like it or not, it's just beginning. With Golik and Wingo. Yeah, that's right, Mike. I danced during off the oh top. Oh my that's gosh, what I do. you really did your chair yeah. dance. Uh, the magic of radio. It's you're awful. welcome. Uh, the Cavaliers led the magic by as many as 21 points, but they collapse in the second half and they actually fall 116 to 98. Epic failure for Cleveland. I, I don't even know where to go. I, I, I think I'm one of the last ones trying to hang on being from Cleveland and, you know, knowing what Cleveland fans went through all the years of me growing up, but finally getting the championship with LeBron and, getting the Indians being so close, being in the World Series, and the normal January swoon for the Cavaliers. But, boy, this one really is starting to feel different here. Outscored 65-31 in the second half. Only scored nine points in the fo- in the fourth quarter. Ty Lue ends up in the locker room in the second half because he's sick. Maybe he's sick of what he's seeing on the court, even though the first half looked good for the Cavaliers in this one. It is just spiraling down the toilet. Yeah, a lot of people thought Ty Lue was just getting taken out to pasture at yeah. halftime and they were finally <laughs> moving on there. But for the Cavs, they just are reinventing ways to be bad. LeBron James, no points or assists in the second half. Isaiah Thomas, no points, points in the yeah, second half. That was right. He had no no rebounds and, and assists. That no was, that rebounds was, yeah, there and was assists. A, there was Sorry. a typo there. No rebounds. I, I fell for the same thing, but uh, you know, we, we figured we'd let you fall. Thanks a lot, Stats. And yeah, no I just problem. sounded like an idiot yeah, for two did. hours. Uh-huh. Yeah, you did. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what we do. Oh man, that was my Isaiah Thomas impersonation. By the way, throw everyone else under the bus after the game. How in a public setting. He is doing who a whole is, lot of who talking, is isn't he? So here's the difference between Cleveland this year and years past. In years past, they haven't necessarily looked great, but we expect them to turn the switch. This year, they flat out look bad. That's a difference between what we saw last year, year before. We're used to LeBron can just always make things magical happen. When you've looked as bad as the Cavs have looked so often. I don't think you can just suddenly remember how to, to finish a game or remember how to actually play defense. And the amount of points that they're giving up night in and night out is disgusting. It's ridiculous. They got Minnesota up next. I mean, and, and, and how much of this, you know, a lot of people put a lot of it on effort. And, and if that's the case, then you, they, they should just all be so flat out embarrassed if – we're not talking about X's O's as much as we're talking about actual effort on the court. Then as, as I say all the time, you better, you got to look long and hard in the mirror, but it doesn't seem like that matters to these guys. I understand that in especially professional sports, not everyone's going to like each other. Not everyone's going to be right. friends, but I am amazed in the NBA with how much smaller the locker rooms are comparatively, how reckless guys are in the way they talk. We've seen it in jo- with John Wall, who's currently injured, and what he said on SportsCenter the other night with Michael Smith talking about his team in his absence, and this continued dr- Isaiah Thomas just being the go-to quote guy for Cleveland and all of this. It seems like this team genuinely, in a lot of instances, doesn't like each other in ways that manifest on the court like they don't like playing basketball together you just wait till you leave don't don't keep the radio on you have no idea what we're going to say about you the minute you're gone yeah it's exactly right i mean that's just what's going to happen yeah, that's, that's fine works. once i'm gone i don't tune to the show anyway so oh. <laughs> wow that was awful uh speaking of awful off the top the thunder defeated the warriors 125 105 an awful night for golden state Warriors fell to one and four against the rockets and thunder this season and by the way the rockets just one game behind Golden State uh, in the West right now. This is the first time the Warriors never led in a game at home since Steve Kerr became the head coach in 2014. It's also the first time the Warriors never led in a game this season. There's only two teams uh, left that uh, have not suffered a wire-to-wire loss. That would be the Celtics and the 76ers. Warriors Warriors had 25 turnovers in this one. Draymond Green is what has his, his league-high 13th technical, so... This is, you know, for, for just handing them basically the title, and still they're going to be the heavy favorite going in the, and, and losing here to the Thunder, but I think most people really kind of look at the Rockets. Is that going to be the team that has the best shot to dethrone them, even though the Thunder just put it on them right now? Yeah, it, it's... The top end performance five and two against the top five teams in the league this year are the Thunder and them and the Rockets are giving people hope. I hope I think they needed considering the usual teams that challenge Golden State are down this year. Kawhi Leonard and the Spurs right. are really out of the picture. The Cavaliers we just talked about are in disarray. And so the teams that made the moves this offseason are seeing the return on their investment, which I think is good. In an NBA where we wondered would this offseason shuffling do anything other than entertain us in that moment? 
The answer up until now has been yes. Our line is always, well, let's see it in the playoffs when you've got to beat them four times out of seven. But at least right now you can say if you're a team going forward that's thinking about making big wholesale changes in the interest of beating Golden State, right now it looks like that's at least a working theory that's coming true. Now, I'm not willing to jump off the Golden State bandwagon the way I am Cleveland. I do think that there's a switch, obviously. A little bit of a difference, yeah. This is the one where we say, okay, they're going to figure that out before the finals come. But the interesting thing is that we're really looking at a Western Conference final that's going to be far more compelling than the actual NBA finals this year because the Western Conference is flat out stacked. It's just going to be a better watch. They they are, though. You wonder the Celtics have given the Warriors a game, but you're sitting there with the Celtics and the Raptors with 16 losses and the Warriors and the Rockets with 13 losses. So I I think I'm with you. If it ends up being the Warriors and Rockets playing for the right to get to the NBA Finals, I think that probably would turn out to be a better series than what we think the Finals could be. That Toronto team might finally be able to take a step forward. DeRozan and Lowry have been playing really well, albeit a little bit of a setback. I think they lost to the Sixers last night. But um, a, a team that's really deep, that's got two quality guys, that seems to be the medicine. You've got to have a way to be dynamic when your best lineup is off the court for a bit. Speaking of the best. Off the top. It was a tough night for the best player for the Knicks. Christoph Porzingis, the NBA's leader in blocks, <laughs> tore the ACL in his left knee after landing awkwardly on Giannis Antetokounmpo's foot after a dunk in the second quarter of a loss to Milwaukee. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a tough call there for Nick fans. And you want to do a quick correction on that? The Raptors won last yeah, night? Yeah, no, the Raptors beat the Celtics by like 20 last yeah, night. Okay. I don't know what game. I was watching, I was watching I the know. Sixers before. They beat somebody. Did, didn't, didn't really understand what jersey you were looking at. There's a lot one. of NBA action last night. I was hooking yeah. it all to my veins. Unfo- I can- unfortunately for the Knicks, though, that, as, as Jason mentioned, after a dunk coming down on Antetokounmpo's, uh, foot, Tearing his ACL. They said there was some hope after the game because they saw him walking around a bit, but we've seen that. I, I know you have. I know I have. Mike, time and time again, a, a, a teammate or another player walking around after hurting the knee and thinking, okay, maybe it's not that bad and with the, with the ACL tear and you're done for the year. I mean, what does this do for a team? They were sitting in the what? The 11th slot, uh, five games out of the playoffs right now, but you have Porzingis, and that's who you're going to build around for the future. This young seven foot three superstar in the league, and now you got to be going. Uh oh, for a big man with a lower body injury, you never know how that goes down the road. We just ran through this list of concerns with Demarcus Cousins when right. he went down with the Achilles injury. For a guy that size, the historical comps coming back from that didn't work in his favor. And we know, looking back at other big stature wise, I mean, Greg Oden was the case yeah. at, the, at the top of the people's uh, most people's list for things like this. And now for the Knicks, you've got nowhere to go but down, right? You have to try and basically get out of this season with the best possible draft status possible because winning at this point, we've talked about this in the past with the Knicks plenty of time, does you absolutely no good from here on out. It's also going to affect the Knicks going into next year because Porzingis, when he comes back, whatever level of him right. that they get, they won't get him back until some way through next season. So it's not just a one-year, it's right. a two-year correction required in New York. Off the top. Off the top. This is a special day for college football. It's National Signing Day. Georgia enters with the number one class in ESPN's recruiting rankings. The biggest difference is nearly three quarters of the big signings are done because they have the early signing period in December. So the, most of those players uh, are already signed, though you still had going into the week 46 guys at the top that were still uncommitted. So we'll see where they end up probably in Alabama. Uh, but most, <laughs> quite honestly, though, a lot of the teams don't have a lot of room left. When three quarters of, of the, of the class is basically signed, there's not a ton of room left. Uh, but as you mentioned, Georgia, they have the top player who's the quarterback and the quarterback is still going there after just uh, what happened. You know, with Georgia and the quarterback that came in and Fromm was a true freshman, comes in for Eason, who's transferring to Washington. So Fromm's the quarterback and the top quarterback in the country comes to Georgia. So man, they're stacked there and looking good right now. Alabama sitting at number four right now, entering National Signing Day. They signed the top three class every year between 2008 and 2017. Not a shock at all, but a big day. You know, I remember when you had yours, you used to did your signing on, on the show and with Mike and Mike and, Jake did the same thing, but a big day for for you guys to finally make it official when you're going to go to your college. It was. There was a wonder how this early signing period would affect things, and to your point, the, the make-it-take-it league that uh, the NCAA is for college football, but 
for this day now, I think what it'll morph into, because you're right, it used to be just that moment for everyone involved. Yeah. And now that you split that up, what today really becomes and what you read about the number of top players that waited till today is this really will be that last ditch period where coaches and staffs are trying to court some of the top players. Those guys that traditionally have taken longer to make those decisions, sometimes after signing day for guys in years past, are really going to be the focus of now is the bulk of your class is going to be put together in that first signing period for guys who would have been three stars like me right. who want to make sure, all right, my commitment is sealed so that there's no funny business as they chase those four and five star guys late in the process. And are we still faxing? Is that, is that what we're still no. doing? It's not, we're not faxing <laughs> no. anymore. Okay. I, I talked to Jeff Collins, the Temple coach, when we yeah. were doing their bowl yeah. game. It was right around si- the, the initial signing period, and we asked them. The fax machine is officially out, it's so not, I don't but, know who's still using them. But, but it's been around. I mean, uh, it didn't go away 10 years ago, right? It's been around, right? I mean, the, yes. the, the facts you get in. I was always amazed at that. Now you can download an app on your phone. I, I, there's got to be a works as a fax, signing day is, app. Yeah. This, this is what we do. Yeah, that's pretty wild. So we'll end with the most confusing. Off the top. So the opening ceremonies aren't until Saturday, but the or Friday, but the competition for the 23rd Olympic Winter Games starts today in Pyeongchang. Yes, it does. Yeah, well, I'm, to fit everything in in the time frame they need, they need to start some of the, the, the competitions today. The first medal uh, uh, given out, I think, are going to be Saturday in Pyeongchang. But the, the uh, uh, as you mentioned, the opening ceremonies on Friday. I, I, I what did, I, did I say it wrong? Did you I say it wrong? Pyeongchang. It's Pyeongchang. Pyeongchang. I went the other way. I reversed it. You went okay. Wang Chung. I don't I, fault I, you. I'll just say Winter Olympics now and, and nothing more. <laughs> uh, but they have, they have added four events. Do you guys see they added four events to this thing? No. no. Four new events. They are, uh, mixed doubles in curling. Doubles? Mixed doubles in curling. Men's and women's mass start. It's speed skating, a mass start in speed skating, team event alpine skiing, and men and women's big air in snowboarding. So 102 medal events in 15 sports. The U.S. team, by the way, is the largest uh, athlete delegation for any nation in Winter Olympic history. So I love it. Can't wait to watch it all from the biathlon to ski jumping to the luge to alpine to figure skating. I love it all. So I, I know you're into it as well, aren't Has you? Has curling become the most talked about Winter Olympic sport now? Is well, it to the point where it's it was such a niche idea before and now, especially coming off? Are, are, what bubble do you live under that, that curling would be bubble? What rock do you live under that curling would be more talked about? Than figure skating. Well, cur- come on, curling has become very, very popular. It's hot in the streets, man. And now, yeah. some of that is people lampooning the idea that curling is a sport. But talking to people who, during the trip to Minnesota yeah. for the Super Bowl, participated in some curling. Trey uh, took part with some of the NFL Live guys in curling and said it is a difficult endeavor. But it is Trey. I've never. Well, that is yeah, that is true. Yeah, not true. Uh, he's a uh, not not a mathlete or an athlete, there but somewhere yeah. in the midst of all that. But I'm interested. What does doubles look like? Because you said mixed doubles is now added, but that means there was regular doubles before yep, that means yep. there was sex specific doubles I'm with you. what's that I'm look with like you. can we work on maybe fielding a curling team in a few years i think we should give it a go i think th- this is our, and, and our with shot the, you bring up figure skating listen i love watching figure skating but it always comes under fire for the judging you know because a lot of these other things are uh, you know you you have a definitive outcome by time of going down a hill or a luge or whatever but you know when you're at you're looking for the it's like the the um the gymnastics in the Summer Olympics, you're, you're basing it on judges. It can get a little iffy. The best part about sitting in this chair is sometimes I get to have the last word. So I, I'd leave off the top with this hot take. The Winter Olympics are better than the Summer Olympics. That wow. is off wow. the top. Wow. That's, that's, you're welcome, America. Uh-huh. Golik and Wingo uh, presented by 1-800-Flowers. This year, be the one who wins Valentine's with 1-800-Flowers.com. Right now, you can get 18 pink and red enchanted roses. For only twenty nine ninety nine to order, go to one eight hundred flowers dot com slash ESPN. So we we made it all the way through off the top. Yes, and, we did, and we didn't even say the word Patriots. We didn't say the word Colts, and we didn't say the word Josh McDaniels, which I think is a record. So now we can wow. get to obviously the the staggering news as Josh McDaniels, according to Colts' uh, official Twitter account, was going to have his press conference today to be announced as the new head coach for the Colts. And then all of a sudden last night, bam, no, he's gone. This is a move to me that absolutely pins the Colts against the wall in a bad way. And it's actually, it's actually quite an inspiring move for the Patriots in, in a world where we thought there was going to be a ton of change. Now it looks like, hey, guess what? There's at least one piece that's going to stay here and it makes it feel like continuity is accomplished in New England. I mean, there's so many 
tangents to this. I don't even know where to start, you know, from why he turned it down to coaches that have already signed there to be on a staff that are going to stay there for the new coach, whoever that's going to be. But first and foremost, we have to try and figure out what was the reason. You know, and you got Shefty saying basically, well, he was on your show last night, was he not? Yes. Adam Schefter basically saying it wasn't about Andrew Luck's shoulder. It was just about his relationship to New England and his family in New England. Is that where he yeah, was going? And, and, and I understand that. It looks like the immediate reporting from Shefty was that it was more about he just didn't feel comfortable and he was going back and forth. But do, I mean, do any of us really buy that? If you are a hundred percent on board with Andrew Luck as his shoulder is healthy, this team, you've got a, a premier quarterback. Do you really walk away from that job? I mean, I, I, I don't know where to go with this from Luck's shoulder to is it he didn't want to move the family again? His wife, they have four kids. You know, he's in Denver and then St. Louis and then I've been here in, in, uh, New England for since 2012. Did he, he got a sweetened deal, but there's no way it's as much money as he would have got as a head coach. Is there a promise that when Bill retires, he's going to be the coach? I mean, there's a lot of things to look at with this. There are a lot of things, and I, I struggle weighing between the two options of, is this more about, because the shoulder is the first thing I went to, that yep. Josh McDaniels knows something that the rest of us don't about Andrew Luck's short, shoulder. More reported on Sunday, there are doctors that think he may need another shoulder, uh, surgery shoulder, right. on that shoulder. <laughs> And so there's that side of it, and there's weighing, is that enough to disincentivize you from going to a place where if Andrew Luck is healthy, you've at least got the quarterback of your future planned out there for the time being, whereas now in New England, what's the advantage here? You come back with all that familiarity, but most people think the way they have for the majority of the season that Bill Belichick is not long for this world based on the strife and turmoil that we've seen. So has he been promised he's the coach in waiting? Does that moment come sooner than later? Do we read more into the stuff going on with Tom Brady and Malcolm Butler as signs that Bill Belichick is slowly losing grip in a way that would be advantageous for Josh McDaniels to stick around because how good is that job when Bill and Tom are gone? Because that moment's coming sooner than later there. So all of these things I think are too closely intertwined to separate and say one way is more than the other, but there are definitely enough tangents to go on to fill a four-hour radio show. And the Colts don't care about any of that, do they? (laughs) No, I mean, ultimately the Colts are sitting there trying to figure out what to do next. Hey everyone, Mike Golick here. Support for the Golick Wingo podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. With Rocket Mortgage, you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. There are two Golics, uh, no Wingo today, though. I'm Jason Fitz in for Trey. Uh, Devil went down to Georgia. And, and Jason Fitz will be playing that in our studio. We're just going to use you like a, yeah. like a prop to do that. That's going to happen. You probably hate it. No, you know, no, 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 no. How long did you play in the band, Perry? How many uh, years? I toured with them for like six, five or six years. Six years, and so you make the transition into this. So you you want to separate yourself from music now, so you hate when we do this, don't you? you? Know, no, I will say when I first started working for ESPN, I was very, like, I wanted to separate the two because I wanted people to to understand that I, I'm not just a fiddle player, that I I, I deserve to be here. There was right. that, that, like, hey, You're not just I a pretty do, face. Right, right, exactly. And then, uh, then I got comfortable, and I said, you know, forget it, as long as people are talking about me. I don't really care. Yeah. So, okay. uh, whatever it takes. I'll, I will serenade you with, with, uh, fiddle or like violin that. music all day long, Mike. <laughs> uh, whatever it takes to stay in this seat. Figured out the content was content. There you go. Exactly <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, I'm just saying, I mean, Trey's out on vacation and, you know, I'm in the chair and is he going to serenade you with, uh, you know, flowers and, and, classical music cuz I will. You will. And we're going to we're going to get to know you a little bit better for our audience. We do the we did a segment when when Trey started on the show called Try Trey to get to know Trey a little better. We're going to do it with you as well. And I've already gotten to know you a little bit. Now now for those that may not know, you guys have a history of this who you worked on a college football show together. Uh, during college football season, what was it, two seasons ago? It ran mm-hmm. for a year. That's where yeah. you two first met? Yes. yes that yeah. was back in the day already. You've seen us probably gallivanting around my, uh, my living room on right. Twitter. <laughs> yeah. The and, college uh, football playoff rankings reaction right? show. Yes. Very longest uh, name in wordy history. Really yeah, wordy yeah, name. We really need to do card. a better job. So with we're, we're going to get to know you yeah. a little bit later as well, but, uh, we got a little situation here to get to. <laughs> right. To know. So the, the Colts are trying to figure out how they're going to get to know a new head coach and, right. and Josh McDaniels decides not to take this job which uh, puts the Colts behind the eight ball and trying to figure out 
sort of where to go here and what to do next. They already had a couple of coaches under contract. Those guys are going to stay. So right. now they're picking from a limited pool of coaches because many guys have already taken jobs. In fact, everybody that they uh, interviewed for this job initially has accepted another job somewhere else. So they're picking from a limited new pool, and they're doing it behind the eight ball with the combine just a couple of weeks away. I, I can't even fathom the between a rock and a hard place they're in right now. They're going to get in this former assistant coach to be an assistant coach who's going to be a first time head coach unless they want to go grab somebody who hasn't coached in a while that nobody really thought of to kind of fill the void for now. That's the thing. I mean, the coach they hire now, I mean, is this going to be the coach for the next five years or are you in scramble mode that says we need to get somebody in there, kind of right the ship and then we'll look into this in another year? I, I have no idea. Yeah. This screams veteran coordinator yeah. or veteran assistant coach who's been around long enough and can just plug the gap for one year, who's going to be able to come in and work with someone else's groceries. Because, again, you've got your D coordinator and D line coach under contract for all the talk about Josh McDaniels being unsure throughout this process. He was sure enough to convince two guys to sign on the dotted line was. for that organization. So that seems pretty damn sure to me. Well, we're trying to figure out what it all means. Greg Doyle, who writes for the Indy Star, is thrilled with that McDaniels backed out. This is what he said. Well, he's a loser. I mean, he, the Colts didn't know it. Sometimes you get lucky in spite of yourselves. You know, you might, I don't know, foul a ball off off your foot, but it, go, it bounces over the second base and you get a double out of it. I mean, I, I don't know how the Colts got lucky, but they did. They, they are not stuck with the infection that we're going to call Josh McDaniels. They're not stuck with him. He can replace Belichick, and without Belichick someday, without Brady someday, he can go 3-13 and 13 there, and we can all have the last laugh here in Indiana. We avoided Josh McDaniels. I was going to have to deal with that sick little punk for the next three or four years or until he got fired in the middle of year two like in Denver. I was going to have to deal with him on a daily basis, and it was going to make me sick to go to Colts Complex and look at that smug little jerk in the face. Now I don't have to deal with it. I think it's great. I mean, I'm happy. I, I wonder if, and I don't know this, I, I, if, if Greg Doyle, <laughs> when, when it was basically a done deal the last few weeks, was Doyle saying this? Was he this adamant against Josh McDaniels, when we all knew Josh McDaniels was going to be offered that, I don't know that for a fact. I have he, no idea. He, well, he was on with Will Kane yesterday before all of this dropped, saying that it's a terrible hire and he didn't like it. I want to know, like, Greg, did Josh hurt you? Like, what, what, do you need a hug, buddy? Like, what this happened is a, there? This is a good salt of the earth Midwesterner <laughs> rebelling against the Northeast because you heard it. He, 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 you know, laid into the Patriots too and said the, you know, the Northeast, they're jerks and losers and they don't know how to win with class. <laughs> this felt like a lot of regional bias built into this as well. The, the uh, there's a tweet from uh, our own uh, Diana Rossini who says she spoke with several members of what was supposed to be Josh McDaniels' indie coaching staff. They have not heard from Josh McDaniels regarding the change of heart, so they're just as blindsided as the rest of us. And we know there are two. Is it Matt uh, Eberfluss is was the with the Cowboys and Mike Fair, who was with uh, Illinois as a D line coach? They're the ones that signed, and they're staying. They're going to be on that coaching staff, whoever the new coach is, because they signed those contracts. But man, I I, I still don't know which way to go here. From is it is it uh, a luck shoulder? Is it he got again. He got that his deal sweetened, but there's no way they're paying him what a head coach is going to make. There's no way he's making five, six million dollars to be the offensive coordinator. At least I don't think so. So is it? Hey, Bill's only going to be here maybe another couple of years. You're going to be the next guy, and does one or two years turn into more, and then you got a guy saying, "Well, I'm not going to sit around." I, I don't know if that usually works out the way you want it to, but boy, he seems to have gotten some assurances of something. Think about the ripple effect if you are considering hiring Josh McDaniels ever again for a job. And if you're considering joining his staff ever again for a job, because there will have to be some level of hesitance, right, from from a team or from if you're an assistant coach and Josh calls and says, hey, why don't you come join my staff? Uh, I saw yeah. what you did to the last group of guys. I mean, that that has to be part. He has to have an assurance because how does he build anywhere outside of that building ever again? Well, it's it's like looking and saying, well, 
you know, you had, uh, you're with someone who just cheated on their spouse. And so you assume they're not going to cheat on new, you now. No, you've seen his past history here. You know, Josh McDaniels MO now with all of this. So to your point, it's difficult, especially in the coaching ranks. Forget what an organization may right. think, because most organizations, I think, if you're good enough at what you do, are willing to look past things like this. We see it happen enough with players where guys have character issues or things that pop up that would be red flags where if you're good enough, it doesn't really matter. But other coaches, now that you've stabbed guys like that in the back, because even, you know, we see that from Diana. Josina Anderson put up a tweet that Josh McDaniels, uh, you know, she's heard from sources. Josh McDaniels spoke to every one of his assistants after he talked to the Colts. So, how, wherever in the timeline that took place, because if it's after, that's still pretty late in the game to find out in all of this. Considering the Colts found out late enough to where they had that awkward tweet promoting the press conferences up hours after this had happened. You look at this situation, you say, how is a coach going to trust Josh McDaniels yeah, again when yeah. he goes to build so the So again, you had the report from Diana saying that, that those coaches did know. Jocena saying that Josh did talk to those coaches. So obviously it's an somewhere. Hour, an hour after uh, Diana tweeted uh, that. So uh, Exactly. So I, I guess my thought, too, is now, as I said all the time about about players and about coaches, everybody has their reasons, and every reason is different. We're not there, so we don't know. As I said with with a player at times, is it money? Is it geography? Uh, is it going for a ring? What What's your reason? Where are you in your career? If it's a coach, is it, can you be a head coach? Where would you be the head coach? Family situations, he has four kids, he and the wife, and four kids. Did he not want to move? Does he like where he is right now? Was that going to be an issue? That, that stuff we don't know, but the bottom line is a lot of people think, well, okay, they sweeten the deal, but it's certainly not going to be what a head coach would make. So is it going to be, you're going to be the coach when Bill leaves? Well, then you start to think, okay, when Bill leaves, that means Bill's gone and Brady's only going to be there another, I, I got to believe, year or two top. So, man, where, where, you, you may be comfortable there, but that team certainly isn't going to be what it is right now when those two are gone and you're the head coach. But, and again, as I said, you may just say, I'm comfortable here. If I'm going to be the head coach here, that means stability for me and my family for already since 2012 and maybe a lot more years to come. Maybe that was important to him. You're listening to Go Look and Wingo on ESPN Radio and ESPN2, presented by Progressive Insurance. All guests on the Shell Penzoil Performance Line. Mike, I understand that you can turn down a job for a lot of reasons, and it's okay. But you can't turn down a job this way for a lot of reasons and have it be okay. You can't let it get to the point that the team is out there tweeting, hey, here's the introductory press conference. You can't let it get to the point that everybody's agreed to terms and then change your mind and have it still feel okay. If there was this level of, of hesitance, the team should have known about it. It never should have been announced. To let it get to this point is, I think, the, the, the moment you can't walk it back from. And I also think there's a ripple effect to this. For other teams in the future, if you're ever looking at a head coach of a Super Bowl team, you have to look at this as the potential negative if you can't get something worked out in a way that it's a done deal early in the process. Because if you're betting on a coordinator from a Super Bowl caliber team, you can get stuck like right. this with no coach and no option. That's a terrible spot for a franchise to be in, not just right now, but for the next two, three, four years. It is, and when you couple all of that with the uncertainty that drives some of this decision-making surrounding their star quarterback, surrounding the decisions they got to make going forward, this I mean, this can set a franchise like the Colts back years if Andrew Luck's shoulder truly isn't in the place it needs to be, and you don't even have that to hang your hat on and sell going forward. I, I, I just And at some point, I imagine we'll know – and maybe we'll start to learn more about the Malcolm Butler, which we even got more info on that. And look at how quickly that got pushed to the side now uh, with what's going on with Josh McDaniels. But there's that to talk about. I mean, there are so many things of a percentage. It was Is it anything to do? Anything to do with Andrew Luck's shoulder? Should there be any concern on Indianapolis Colt fans that say, okay, we didn't get that as a coach, but why? Is there something wrong with Andrew Luck? What's going on there? Is Josh going to be the new coach in New England whenever Belichick is done? There's a lot of things out there. The bottom line is we thought he had a job and he left. We put it on at Golick and Wingo. We put the question up there. What's the job you left the quickest and why? <laughs> so if you took a job and you left it quickly, how quick did you leave it and why did you leave it? That quickly, so uh, we'll, we, we, that's the question up there, so we look forward to your answers to that one. We've been having all sorts of straight talk this morning mm-hmm. about uh, the NFL drama, but the NBA will not be outdone in the oh, drama boy. category, ever, ever. And at this point, we, the Cavs are just broken, 
and, and we're getting used to them losing, but we're also getting used to con- constant chaos after every loss. It, 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 we've reached a point. Isaiah Thomas comes out uh, after the the loss last night and and has some sort of harsh words about the way the team is coming together. I almost feel like guys are trying to get traded at this point. Everybody wants off this ship because it is sinking at an alarming rate. The wheels have fallen off of the Cavs, and I don't see how they get put back on. I. I- I'm amazed at what's going on uh, here, and and you alluded to it with Isaiah Thomas. This is what he had to say after the game. As players, we got we got to do better. I mean, when when they start to go on their runs, which teams is going to do each and every game, we got to come together. And it's like right now, when when we hit adversity, we go our separate ways, and that's just that's just how I feel, and, and it looks like that as well, and. Guys start to go one on one offense, and then defense is every man for itself. There, there are those that would say they like hearing the truth uh, from Isaiah Thomas. Is that's if that's what's happening? But there are others that are like, "Eh, I heard you this morning." And, and as former players, you know, again, different sport doesn't matter if you're a former player in a locker room. What you want to go out publicly and what you want to stay in the locker room? Yeah, it's just this just seems suspect for me, and people are going to say that. Someone needs to say it because the Cavs are clearly devoid of a lot of leadership right now, at least what we're seeing outwardly. But leadership to me isn't pointing the finger at everyone in the public setting after all these games. We heard them have what appear to be a fruitless conversation behind closed doors where maybe this didn't come to fruition. So maybe it's a desperation heave. But even then, true leadership usually acknowledges its own place in these problems where with Isaiah, it's constantly been, well, we were bad on defense before this. Yeah, I called Kevin Love out. All these different things that never really thumb point. It's all finger pointing. Don't you have to read the room at some point too and and sort of accept that you're the new guy in this situation that's not necessarily being received or playing at the level people wanted? So to come in and be like, hey, everybody's just uh, falling apart this whole thing is is broken uh, that seems alarming to me when you're not the voice of that locker room yet and frankly you haven't earned the opportunity to be the voice of that locker room that takes time it it, it does take time but you know to your point earlier you know about do what what are the that's what i want to know the thought process of the guys in that room and we're not going to to know that uh fully what's going on there but for the fact for lebron in a game that they're winning uh at halftime 67 to 51 and for the second half, LeBron to have no rebounds and no assists. No rebounds and no assists. First time since 2016. I find that somewhat amazing to have that fall apart like that, a different, a turnaround of 39 points to be up 21 and lose by 18. I, and everybody sits there and points to it as a lot of it is effort. And Mike, you know this. I mean, it, it, that's, that's the most damning thing to an athlete. The most damning thing. If, if, if you look at, that team or that person, you say, you know what? They're not trying. They're just not trying hard enough. They, they just don't look like they, they give a damn out there. That's about as bad as you can be talked about as an athlete because that's the one thing, no matter what your skill level is, you can control your effort. And if you look like, and everybody's saying, and even the guys on the team are kind of leading you along to that, that that is, I, I just can't fathom that thought process and that feeling like that. Well, it's a team full of guys all doing that yeah. too. It's not just one guy that's dragging it down. Right. It's everybody on that team. The bad body language award for the all time going to the entire Cavaliers roster right now, and you just wonder where it ends. You wonder. We've heard so much of this pointed at LeBron, who said he's not waving his no trade clause. Seems to be there for the long haul, but there seems to be some growing friction between LeBron and everybody else in all this. That I I don't know if it gets resolved. And I don't know if it's one of those things where anyone on either side is right. Now that is some straight talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. There's not an easy solution for Cleveland. No. It's not about getting a guy. It's not You can't fix whatever is wrong in that locker room. Yeah, trade deadlines are not going to do a thing for them at all. This is going to be about players stepping up and being accountable for, for what, they're, what, what they're doing on the court. And when it's this broken emotionally, I'm not sure it easily gets fixed. Yep. Coming up, more trouble brewing in New England, plus... A Hall of Famer continues to make the same mistake. Go look and wing on ESPN Radio and ESPN2.